Dear students, in the previous lectures we talked about the pathogens that are present in drinking water and what are the general mechanisms or techniques through which we can detect them. Now, if we want to ensure the safety of our drinking water, it is very, very important for us to know where pathogens are present in drinking water and in which places they are not present. Unless we have that information, we cannot ensure safety because safety involves two aspects. One is proper disinfection and the other is public awareness. Now, there, is, there are multiple tools and techniques available for um, detecting pathogens in drinking water. However, our regulations in our country are very strict about which uh, technique should be followed and when and how. And each of these techniques, whether it is the one that is mandated by our regulations or the ones that are preferred by scientists, ones that are preferred by lab personnel, all of them have certain advantages and certain limitations. So today let us go ahead and explore the limitations of the techniques that we have talked about earlier and the ones that we are going to talk about now. So the primary question that we are trying to answer right away is how are we going to monitor all of our pathogens and how are we going to keep our drinking water safe? So step is to analyze pathogens and most of the tests that we use for analyzing the pathogens are very time consuming. For example, a simple bacteria might require at least overnight culturing to grow. Total coliforms, fecal coliforms often require incubating for 24 hours. And in that 24 hour, consider, considerable damage to public health is possible. So when public health is involved and we want to ensure that the water that our public is getting exposed to and is consuming is safe, these tests, these time consuming tests are going to cause great harm. And thus there is need for other kind of technologies. And Usually our um, regulations, not just in our country, India, but across the world involve only indicator microorganisms. Now let us spend some time try, trying to understand what indicator microorganisms are. So pathogens are dangerous for us. If I try to grow them in the lab or if I try to test whether they are present in a sample or not, in case they are present in the sample, the only way I can test is by growing them in suitable media and noticing if they show a signal of presence or not. This is cultural based detection technique. Now when I am growing them or when I am culturing them in the lab, I am increasing their concentration many fold, much much more than the infectious dose and thus I as a lab personnel am at risk of catching the infection. Not only that, but I am also at risk of spreading the infection in people around me and thus in the general public. Thus, what our agencies do across the globe is we use indicator microorganisms. These indicator microorganisms usually colonize our gut and thus represent the our indicator for fecal matters, uh, contamination of fecal matter in drinking water. And they are typically not dangerous, not pathogenic for human beings. So if we detect indicator microorganisms, we can be sure to some degree that perhaps there are pathogens present. Now, what are the general characteristics of indicator microorganisms? How do we decide that F1 fuzz is a good indicator virus for um, drinking water, but some other fudge or virus is not an indicator? First of all, the indicator microorganism should always be present when pathogens are present and always absent when pathogens are absent. So basically, it should be like, um, okay, to use, uh, to give you a general example, it should be best friends with pathogens. It should be always there when pathogens are there, it should always be absent when pathogens are not absent. So it should have same source as pathogen and same fate as pathogens. It should be applicable to all kinds of water, whether it is saline water, whether it is clear drinking water or whether it is waste water. And because we know that most of the pathogens we are interested in, in terms of waterborne diseases are, um, are usually found in our gut. We know that fecal matter is the, without doubt, fecal matter is the leading source of contamination in drinking water sources. So these pathogens should be native to our intestinal tract because the pathogens that will eventually go in drinking water sources will come from our gut. The other thing is we have to ensure the safety of lab personnel. So uh, otherwise nobody would want to work in these labs and we will never know if pathogens are present in our drinking water or not. 
So we use indicator organisms. Um, we use fecal coliforms to get an idea of fecal contamination. So as name suggests, fecal. So if they are present, we know that fecal matter is present and the water is not suitable for drinking. If you remember from the last lecture, we talked about that fecal coliform detection in any water sample should be zero for it to be fit, fit for drinking. And the principal genus that is um, detected and grown in for fecal coliform when we do fecal coliform test is E. coli, which is Escherichia coli. It is non-pathogenic, the strain that we grow usually, and it survives longer outside human body. The other advantage of um, using this particular genus of fecal indicator is that it tends to live longer than most pathogens and thus we are on the safer side. It has a very simple test for growing, just requires incubation for one day. And we can use either membrane filter technique where then we grow them on plates or we can use multiple tube tests where we have multiple tubes and we notice the change in pH by noticing change in our indicator dye and know whether fecal coliforms are present or not. So we, I showed you this example in the one of the previous lectures. So here we have total coliforms giving positive sign and here the dark colony if you can see carefully is the fecal coliform E. coli. And then another technique that is quite prevalent across the globe and is also used in India is Collie Alert Kit. So this is a kit where you just put the reagent, add your water, incubate for 24 hours at nearly body temperature and then depending on change of color you know whether fecal coliforms are present or not. Now let us take a look at fecal indicators, what are they? They are surrogate for pathogens and we know that um, feces is unequivocally the single most important source of pathogens in water. Now if we notice that fe feces are present in the water, we are at higher risk of getting ex uh, exposed to pathogens. So if viable fecal indicator is present, it means we have higher risk of falling sick. Now here is a word viable, it is a very important word and I would like to give you some hint on what this word implies. Now viable is any microbe that can grow. Not all microbes are viable as in they are not alive and healthy enough to replicate and increase in their numbers. But viable pathogens are. So basically anything that we can grow on a plate is viable. Anything that can grow anywhere is viable, not dead. Now there are well established methods for detecting E. coli and for detecting coliforms and total fecal coliform and thus it is very useful. And easy to use technique for indirectly detecting presence of pathogens and it has a long regulatory history. So it is, it, in fact it has such long regulatory history that despite of all its limitations, it is nearly impossible, <laughs> not impossible, it is very difficult to suggest and apply other techniques for detection of fecal matter pathogens in drinking water and other surface waters. And you know the good news is most of the time it works. So you go ahead, drink water from the tap and you don't fall sick because your regulatory agency is doing routine testing using the same indicator organisms and they are following the rules that have been laid and it works. Most of us don't fall sick every now and then. But there are growing concerns for fecal indicators. First of all, it's that it's very slow and laborious. It can take anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. In fact, there are certain microbes like mycobacterium, which are found in our biofilms that grow in drinking water distribution system. They can take up to seven, uh, 18, 18 weeks to grow. So these culture-based techniques are very slow and laborious. They require skilled personnel. They have many false positives and false negatives. This is a very important thing because not all um, E. coli or fecal coliform that is present in water may be fit enough to grow on, uh, grow on our plate or grow in our tube and thus we will get a false negative. False positive is also an option when another microbe can utilize the similar um, food that we are giving it, the substrate that we are giving it either on the plate or on the tube and then give us a signal. And then there is a big issue of viable but not culturable. What about E. coli or what about other indicator organisms and pathogens that are viable? So they are alive and they are kicking it which means they are growing rapidly or just growing but we cannot culture them. 
And we have noticed we have noticed this for quite some time now in microbiology that some microbes that are E. coli will be culturable, but some E. coli will not be culturable easily. Thus, we are, and not just E. coli, but there are many other microorganisms that may be viable, but cannot be cultured and grown in lab. Now, here's the thing, an issue. Most of these fecal organisms, they're more sensitive to dis disinfection than our pathogens. So if we have a disinfection agent, uh, disinfection event, then they are likely to outlive pathogens. So let's say I do my drinking water treatment plant uh, and I put the raw water in there and as the water gets treated and processed and I'm very happy that it's working well. And then at the disinfection step, if you remember the last step prior to sending it to storage and then to drinking water distribution system is of disinfection. And let's say I bleach it, I disinfect it. And, and I notice that my total coliform and fecal coliform level is zero and perfectly under limit and I'm very happy and I send it to my DWDS, drinking water distribution system. But it's also possible that while the fecal coliforms died, while the total coliforms reduced in number, the pathogens survive because some pathogens are more persistent in face of disinfectant than fecal coliforms. The current challenges are emerging infectious diseases. Not all diseases uh, are, well some diseases are new and not all of them can have fecal coliforms and total coliforms as reliable surrogates. Then we have increasing demand and competing water usage, which means that we have more and more demand on our raw water supplies, let's say on our groundwater, on our surface water, and less time to do this really slow and laborious test. And also because there is more demand, um, the duration between the uh, one wastewater treatment plant throwing away their effluent and another drinking water treatment plant taking their uh, they're taking in their influent is less. So there is less time that uh, microbes have to undergo natural attenuation. And this is a big issue. Next is we have increasingly impacted source water. So now our surface water, our source water are usually dirtier than they have ever been before. And, I, and a very good example would be Agra and Mathura. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Agra and Mathura in terms of where they are located. And this is a very good opportunity for you to go and uh, Google India's map or look it up and notice where they are. If you already know, very good. So Agra is a historic town. It's also a tourist town. And Mathura has a lot of religious and historic relevance to it. Now both of them have a river, a common river that flows to them. And upstream of Agra and Mathura is our national capital region. Now, as you would have guessed, national capital region is heavily populated, heavily polluted, and many of the untreated waste are dumped in this river. And as such, this river, Yamuna, is nearly dead, which means that its quality, water quality is so bad that we have sort of given up on treating it successfully. Now, this water serves as um, drinking water source for Agra and Mathura. Now, I want to mention here that not all water treatment plants at Agra and Mathura use Yamuna water as their raw drinking water source, but few do. And one of them is very interesting in sense that it is the only water treatment plant in India where we have a biological process for treating water. So they don't have the usual uh, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, or filtration followed by disinfection, storage, and distribution. They have uh, a train, a treatment train that resembles more treatment, uh, more um, the treatment for wastewater than for drinking water. And in biological treatment, in this particular treatment, they use microbes and thick biofilms to um, consume all the organics and all the waste and remove the excess nutrients in the water. So the thing is that this water is so dirty that even if we do our best in removing the turbidity, in removing the coliforms and fecal coliforms, there's a very good chance that we still have some contaminants that either we are not regulating for now or some emerging diseases that we are not aware of or there are viable but not culturable fecal organisms or the possibility that the disinfectant killed our indicators but our pathogens survived. So when our source water gets dirtier, it's more challenging to clean water and it's also more challenging to ensure and test whether the water is clean or not. Now another thing is reclaimed source water. 
Now, um, in de developed countries, we use the word reclaimed source water to um, suggest in a way recycling of water. So, this would seem like this. Let us say there is a river. So let us say there is a river here and there is a town. So this is a town or city and this town uses the surface water of this river as its raw drinking water source. Now in between we have a drinking water treatment plant that disinfects and cleans the water, stores it and then supplies it through its drinking water distribution system. So these three grids that I have made are representative of uh, three different uh, nodes of drinking water distribution system. Now the people in, these in this town utilize this water and generate what is called as waste water. So they use it for drinking, they use it for washing or cleaning or whatever else they need to use it for, agriculture maybe. And when this water has been utilized, they, it is collected again through a very complex system, complicated system and it is diverted towards its waste And this water is now directed towards SIDS wastewater treatment plant. Now here they use a very beautiful biological process to clean the water up to certain, certain standards. It is not, it is nearly very, it is going to be very not feasible and very difficult to clean this wastewater to a standard that matches our drinking water. But now what is happening is we have rapid population increase. So as because of this increase in population which is very rapid and very difficult on our water sources, what we have is an unprecedented in water demand. So now the water demand is so high that this river can no longer meet the demand for this town. And let us say this town does not want to think about other options such as importing the water from nearby villages, nearby towns or exploiting its groundwater for some reasons and it might consider, I mean those are options that it should consider and it might, but another option that it has is it can take this treated effluent of wastewater. It can take this treated effluent of wastewater and instead of throwing it in the river because the usual practice is that we take it and we throw it downstream. So let us say river is flowing in this direction, upstream we took drinking water, downstream we threw uh, the wastewater away. What it can do is it can recycle it and have a specialized drinking water treatment plant that will treat this water up to drinking water quality standards and then supply it to the grid. Now there is a problem here. This reclaimed water, this is called reclaimed water, this reclaimed water has higher number of microbes, most likely very high number of pathogens compared to actual treated drinking water and other contaminants, most of them emerging contaminants and um, other conventional con contaminants at very high level. So it requires a different kind of drinking water treatment or a more thorough drinking water treatment before it is supplied for public health. Now because this reclaimed water usually has a very um, rich chemistry and rich biology, it is possible that when we do our coliform test and our fecal coliform test, we won't get this, we won't get an accurate representation of what is really happening microbiologically. And um, I want to take a moment here and mention that in a developing country like India, 
or not in a developing country like India where we are not, um, where we are still beginning to advance our understanding of drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment and what is relevant in India and not necessarily what is working well outside. And in a highly populated and growing economy like India, this is a reality, the reclaimed water, whether we intentionally bring our treated effluent into a drinking water treatment plant or we take our treated effluent and put it here downstream and then here we have because the city is so populated here we have another drinking water treatment plant and it directly takes it in drinking next drinking water treatment plant. So whether we have river as an intermediate or not but we are using our surface water so exhaustively that pretty soon the effluent of a wastewater treatment plant becomes the raw source water for a, another drinking water, drinking water treatment plant. And so whether we are doing it intentionally reclaiming the water for the same town or another town nearby town is using this treated effluent as its source for raw drinking water. In either case we are utilizing reclaimed water and thus drinking water quality and the uh, techniques that are required to meet those quality in India particularly and other countries like India, other town cities like India is very challenging and there is lot of research that needs to be done here. And then we have a problem of deteriorating infrastructure, something that we can definitely expect from old cities, old towns because with uh, age we have corrosion and we have regular breakdowns and also at times because of poor operation and poor maintenance we tend to have deteriorating infrastructure. Other factors that might deteriorate our infrastructure are um, for example intermittent supply may create a water hammer kind of situation and destroy our pipes. And then we have uh, another issue of bioterrorism which I must admit is not a big issue in our country because um, I mean we ha it has not been a big issue yet, might be in future, hopefully not. Um, alrighty. And then we have opportunistic pathogens residing in biofilms. So apart, I mean apart from all the wonderful treatment that we can do of drinking water and um, all the tests we can do for fecal coliforms or not and let us say uh, when I measure my fecal coliforms and total coliforms at, uh, after disinfection and before and distribution to water network, water distribution network and I say the water is really good, fecal coliforms are zero, total coliforms are negligible and then in the distribution system wonders can happen. For example, pathogens can come in and then they can make biofilms and in biofilms they can grow some of them or they can survive for a long time and when they are fit and healthy they can leave the biofilm and infect people. So in, in all of these cases our fecal indicators do not serve us very well, thus we have growing concerns. So we know that these indicators are inadequate for definitely for reclaimed water and I want to say in developed countries they call it reclaimed water, in developing countries we just call it water because as I mentioned just few minutes earlier, whether we do it intentionally or not it is a reality of our situation. So in 2005 there was a wonderful paper in AEM which is a nice journal and they discussed and tested the validity of the usual indicator organisms when it came to reclaimed water and protecting public health and they measured for their um, they measured total fecal coliforms, enterococci, clostridium perfringens and F specific coliphages which are bacteriophages indicator for viral pathogens. So these were their indicators that they tested and they looked for pathogens that are infectious on enteric viruses, cryptosporium and giardia and they looked at six wastewater reclamation facilities over one period, one year, one year and then their conclusion was that, I will read it aloud because it is really well written, the failure of measurements of single indicator organisms to correlate with pathogens suggests that public health is not adequately protected by simple monitoring schemes based on detection of a single indicator, particularly at the detection limits routinely employed. So there are uh, three things that are happening in this statement, first is that the failure of measurements of single indicator organisms to correlate with pathogens. So in this one year study of six wastewater uh, reclamation facilities, they noticed that the fecal indicators 
and the total coliform indicators and what other indicators we had, they did not correlate well with actual presence of pathogens. So they failed. So they, these indicators are not valid, they are inadequate when it comes to reclaiming water. The other thing they noticed that um, and because of this, the public health is compromised, which is um, our priority to ensure public health. And the third thing they are mentioning is about detection limit, which is very important. And if you go back to your previous lectures, you will notice how many of the pathogens require very, very low amount of, um, very, very low amount of uh, pathogen to actually infect you. But the cultural, culturing techniques and other usual techniques that are implied, for, uh, that are applied for these indicator organisms have a much higher uh, limit of detection. So there might be 100 HAV, HEV, hepatitis A, hepatitis E virus particles present, but the quantity of phage F1 that we will measure would be zero that we would be able to detect. And we will require much higher amounts of hepatitis A and E viruses to get uh, our up, get a positive signal in our indicator viruses. So this is a major challenge in pathogen detection. Let us look at others. So one is low concentration and low infective doses. I mentioned this particularly in case of HIV, hepatitis A virus, cryptospodia, and giardia, that anywhere from 10 to 100 amount of microbes or particles in case of a hepatitis A are sufficient for a healthy individual to fall sick. And then another issue is direct pathogen culturing. Some pathogens can take up to, for mycobacterium can take really long time to get cultured and by that time many people will fall sick. So we will not be able to respond in a timely manner to any outbreak. So think of it this way, there is an HIV hepatitis A or hepatitis E outbreak happening somewhere and we will take some days to respond or whether there is an outbreak or not. In that days, many thousand people might fall sick. The other thing is these direct pathogen culturing is subject to contamination and also ambiguity. We are not sure what we are culturing. And this is a tricky situation. It is not possible for more vi most viruses. For example, in the winter of 2015 and 2016, there was a major jaundice outbreak in Shimla. And when they typed what is causing this jaundice, they found out that it was hepatitis E virus that was causing the jaundice. And detecting the virus, quantifying the virus, is this virus particularly is such a specialized field. First of all, it requires BSL level 3 facilities because HEV, hepatitis E virus is highly contagious and dangerous. So they had to send it all the way to Pune, which is the only place in India that is certified to do this kind of analysis for hepatitis E virus and when they sent it there, it took days for the water samples to go there. In the journey, some pathogens might have died and then they got the results back and in between all this, many thousands of people had fallen sick. And one of the reasons why an institute uh, such as most IITs and other institutes close to Shimla could not do these analyses is a, because they are dangerous, but we could not also do the analysis of the indicator viruses because these viruses are extremely hard to grow. Even people who work on norovirus or hepatitis virus, different kinds of hepatitis virus acknowledge the difficulty in just merely growing the viruses. Now think of it this way, virus does not directly eat food. If you know about virus life cycle, it needs to enter the host and then it uses the resources of the host to replicate make copies and then it kills the host, goes and infects the next host cell. So as such, the vir most viruses are grown by first growing the host cell line. So in case of hepatitis A and E viruses, we will have to first grow the human cell line, then, in, then put the water in it and wait for um, places where the cell lines die. So in case of bacteria, we can have, we'll have colonies growing and here we will have plaque, absence, PFUs. So what is the option? We could, culturing has a lot of limitations and, um, and, and not just culturing but using fecal indicators and are, are, have a lot of limitations especially for our current scenario. So our, our next option is using molecular techniques. Now molecular techniques come with their own set of challenges. For example, uh, but also many advantages. So let's look at advantages first and then we'll go ahead and look at challenges. So the advantages that are here is that they allow us to directly detect the pathogens. They 
eliminate any ambiguity because we know what we are detecting and I'll, I'll tell you how they work and then that will clarify things for you and we have more confidence in the result and it takes less time to do these analyses. So we can detect presence of mycobacterium in a day, don't need to wait for 18 weeks. They have very, very low detection limit, which is really nice for us. So they have very high sensitivity. Remember, as detection limit goes low, we can detect at very low concentration, and thus our sensitivity increases. And they have very high specificity, and we can actually quantify their specificity. Specificity, specificity is the accuracy. So if it says 100 out of 100 times that it says yes, pathogen is present, how many times is the pathogen really present? That is specificity. So the, when you talk of molecular techniques, we are often referring to PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. Now this is a wonderful reaction and I will um, uh, give you homework to watch two videos later. But in short, polymerase chain reaction is a chemical reaction where you can make millions and millions of copies of a single genetic element. So you choose the genetic element that is of your interest. Typically it is the one that is a marker for your pathogen. So for example, for E. coli, we might have a marker. For Shigella, Salmonella, we have a gene. Okay, this gene, if this gene is present, we know Shigella is present. If this gene is present, we know Salmonella is present. So we, you can take these uh, samples and then amplify that particular gene millions and millions of times in few hours. So if it amplifies and if you see a product, because where it was only 10 microbes, 10 pathogens with let us say ten, one gene each, so we had 10 genes in the pool in our water, but now you have amplified it to millions and millions, so you are, it is easier to see these millions. You can actually run it on a gel, gel electrophoresis. We will talk about this technique, so relax. So in, you can run it on a gel and see whether the PCR product is present or not. But there are shortcomings for these molecular biology techniques as well. It is not quantitative. Okay, You know it is present, you can do a presence of center, but you do not know how much. And then you have to concentrate the sample, especially in case of drinking water. You know it is such a sparse sample. It is not like a waste water, it is not very rich. It is an oligotrophic environment, oligo means less food environment. And then next step is DNA extraction, lot of pathogens can be lost in the step when we are actually extracting the DNA. Then we have the issue of PCR inhibition, which is let us say we took our sample, we concentrated it, we filtered it and we got our microbes on the filter paper, we extracted DNA from it and now we are trying to amplify the genes of interest. And maybe there are some molecules present like EDTA which are inhibiting the PCR and I get a false negative when uh, it, uh, pathogen is actually present. And then here is another thing, let us say there are 10 microbes of which 5 are dead, 10 pathogens of which 5 are dead. The DNA extraction step will take all the DNA that is present and these 5 dead my pathogens also have intact DNA that will also be taken up in the DNA extraction step. So in the PCR when we are amplifying the, um, the gene of interest, all of them will give a signal. So here is a room for overestimation of the actual pathogens. And then the other thing is this is very expensive. Um, I, I can tell you I do this and it is really um, consumables are very high in the terms of cost and it requires specialized expertise, special rooms. Um, the way it works is first you filter your sample, so this is filtering and then you extract the DNA and then you can do different kinds of separations to separate your, um, that separate your DNA of interest and then amplify it or you can skip this step altogether. So this is all for this lecture my dear students, in the next lecture we will look at some new and modern molecular techniques that we have apart from PCR, we will go into quantitative polymerase chain reaction, we will go into automated systems that actually detect, we do not have to do anything, just put in the water, it will, uh, it will extract the DNA, it will do the analysis and it will give you a result, which makes things really easy especially um, in areas where we do not have very trained personals. And yeah, that's all for today then. Thank you very much.